Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Family Church. Glad you could join me. Uh, I love October. It's such a great month. And we just finished a four-week sermon series about being a community. We called that Better Together. And we had this, this statement that we really tried to drive home. It said, a community on purpose and with a purpose. And today we're gonna launch into the book of Philippians where we're gonna spend the next six weeks really getting into what I believe is a great picture of exactly that. What does a community look like that has a purpose, that is intentional? What does that look like? So today we'll be jumping into two books. If you wanna grab your Bibles, uh, open up there to Acts 16. I'll start there. And then we'll get into Philippians because it's important, I think, that we lay the foundation for the book we're just about to go into. Um, but I wanna start before I get into Acts with this idea of the blessed strategy because what I want you to see in the text today is the first element that we talk about when we wanna live a life on mission is to begin with prayer beginning with prayer and, and in asking God, God, where are you at work and how can I join you and where do you want me to go? Now keep that in mind as we go into today's story in Acts 16, and I'm gonna start at verse six. We're gonna look right now together at what is the foundational building block for the church in Philippi, which the book of Philippians is written to by the Apostle Paul. So let's start there in Acts and let's look at three key people as it comes out, but it starts in a really cool way. First, Acts 16, verse six says this, and they went through the region of Phygeria and Galatia, uh, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. I mean, this is an incredible moment. The Holy Spirit is leading Paul as they're, he's going with others into a missionary journey, and they're obviously in communication with the Spirit. They've been praying, they've been seeking, but look at this, it forbid them from proclaiming the gospel. What was that like for them? But look, it goes on more, it says this, and when they had come to Maesha, they attempted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Once again, stop. Nope, you can't go any further. So passing by Maesha, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately he sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Look at the, the beginnings of this movement they had set in their minds to go to Asia, but the Holy Spirit, and then it said, the Spirit of Jesus basically says, no, that's not where I want you to go. I've got something better for you. So let's just get a little more history before we launch in to kind of the message part of the day to understand where we're going. So for those who know a little bit, we've got Italy here and the Mediterranean Sea, but, but here's Philippi. And Philippi is where we're going to, the book of Philippians. And this is where God clearly called them to go. And this moment is incredible to me because Paul had ideas, but he was sensitive to what the Spirit was doing. And then I want you to get a picture of this region so that you understand this isn't just some little backwoods town. This is a port city. I want you to think San Francisco, huge metropolis, uh, commerce, in and out, boat traffic. Most of the time when you see towns on waterfronts, they tend to be big port cities and a lot of things are happening in that region. So I want you to get that picture. And Paul's going to go in and he's going to begin to proclaim the gospel. Well, it said clearly that they felt led to do it. So clearly there must be people ready to receive. So I want to bring up three people from our story. And you can do your devotions this week. If you have those sermon notes, the devotions are going to take you deeper into Acts 16. And then, of course, into Philippians. I really encourage you to do that study because I don't have the time with you today to really accomplish what what you would need to get a better picture. But here's three key figures. We've got Lydia. Now the first person it refers to is Lydia and Lydia says she's a seller of purple goods. Well, purple was the royal color. 
It's also an expensive color to manufacture. So she's intelligent, she's wealthy, she probably has a mansion, she's probably got other houses. Things are going well for her. And then Paul finds her at a place where she is worshiping God. So she's a worshiper of God, but she had not yet a scene or been revealed to her the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he encounters her and he shares the gospel of Jesus. And she says, wow, she responds. And her response looks like this. She gets baptized, her family gets baptized, and she invites Paul to join her for some time at their house. A conversion happens. And what we see here is potentially the first person on the foundation of the church of Philippi. Then there's the slave girl. And this is a a comical story at one level because you got, uh, the sad part is this is a a woman, a young girl who's who's basically demon possessed. She's able to like uh, tell the future though. And so she makes a lot of money and helps people make a lot of money. But Paul arrives and the, the spirit in her has her following Paul around the, around the area and like screaming, I guess, at the top of her lungs, these guys are here to talk about Jesus. And it's a funny thought because it says that Paul gets annoyed with it. And I don't know what the, the conversation was like or how it was being proclaimed, but Paul gets annoyed and he turns around and basically he, he prays that Jesus would intervene with this slave girl and remove this spirit. And what do you know? It works. Jesus comes into the picture, his power is evident, and he removes the spirit from this woman. And then, of course, the people that used her for her ability to tell the future get furious. And the unfortunate part is this puts Paul into jail. Now, the book does not say that she got baptized. It does not say that she came to faith. But I can't help but wonder, her story is in this book, and I think it's there Personally, this is my personal view, because if she had an encounter with Jesus like that, where she found freedom from the spirit that was possessing her, I can't help but think she must have been drawn to this church that was that was forming as Paul was in the area. Well, the third person, of course, is the Philippian jailer. The Philippian jailer was good at his job, and I would say was very took it very seriously. In fact, as, as they put Paul in jail, he, he wasn't necessarily supposed to be punished too much, just housed for a while. But this jailer went in upon himself to go ahead and extend some extra effort of torture and, and other devices on him to restrain him. But there's this incredible moment where you see how serious this jailer is. See, there's this night and, and Paul had been singing and, and you know, he's with uh, others with him and they're, they're singing and they're praising God. And ultimately, earth, the earth kind of quakes and the jail cell doors are burst open and they're just hanging there. They could have fled if they wanted. When this jailer finds out, he takes his job so seriously because he knows if these people escaped that he is going to die. And so he takes his sword ready to to take his own life. And and Paul shouts, hey, 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 don't worry. We're still here. We're still here. And and the response is one that's famous for many of you that understand or know the book of Philippians or the book of Acts. He says, "Uh, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so through this moment, he's been hearing, I'm sure, the gospel preached. He's been hearing songs of worship. And his response is, what must I do to be saved? And so like Lydia, this jailer gets baptized and his whole family gets baptized. And I think what we see here is the beginning, the foundation of the church of Philippi. And this was around 50 AD. This is the, the, the building block for what the the Uh, Philippians book is really going to press into. And so before we jump into that, I just wonder, do you have a community like that? Do you you have a a foundational community of people that that have a faith in Christ? Do you have those those partnerships together in the gospel? I'm reminded as I'm talking about some people that, that I'm very fond of, but also are a part of Family Church here, and they're, they're mainly on the right side. And then the left side, we have a, a group of missionaries, a whole family, the Canes there in Cambodia. But I know that when, when they're serving in Cambodia, this team of people here uh, who are part of Family Church and part of a mission leadership team, they're my gospel partners. We, we take great joy when we hear of the work that's being done across the globe with the other missionaries we work with. And those that we work with find great joy when they hear of what you're doing here at Family Church. 
and how you're praying and how you're giving and, and how you're advancing the gospel in this region. So I just want to ask you, do you have gospel partnerships like that? That you find just immense joy when you, when you see each other because of your love for one another, but also your love for the mission that God's called you to. And you rejoice continually when you think of one another. Well, that's really the essence of the book we're going to get into today. So let's, let's turn to Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. Let's go there. And I want to give you just the, the understanding that I told you that when Paul was in prison with this Philippian jailer, this moment, that was around 50 AD. Well, it's been about 10 or 12 years later now, and Paul finds himself back in prison again. He proclaims the gospel boldly. He's not afraid to stand up for who Jesus is and, and declare with love the need for salvation through Christ. And he finds himself in prison, and he's, he's writing now back to this church, back to potentially Lydia, and that slave girl maybe, and that Philippian jailer, that, that foundational church that has birthed into a larger gathering, a larger body. And he's going to write back to them and share a book, really a book of encouragement. So let's look at that together. We're going to read verses 1 through 11. I'll have it on the screen for you. Follow along with me. Um, but let's just get a picture. Listen to the voice of Paul. Think about the foundations we just read about in Acts. And let's look at his heart for these people. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Do you hear his affection in his writing? Do you hear his heart? God, uh, Paul I would say, is incredibly encouraged about what's happening in Philippi. He's encouraged by the relationships that they had built with him as they support him and care for him. As he remembers whatever their partnership was like, that he also is encouraged by what is transpiring in that area. You see, this book is not like most of Paul's books. Most of the time, Paul writes to deal with something in the church, a correction of either heresy or something that's happening within the church that is causing concern in the area. But this book is a book about encouragement and vision. And so today I thought I'd like to draw out three key elements that I think help lay the foundation for what a gospel partnership looks like. What does that really look like? So let's Let's dive in a little bit and let's talk about the first one. Uh, the first one would be, there's a shared joy. There's a shared joy. This is an important piece of the book of Philippians. Paul is continually going to talk about joy. I want you to, to think about this. We read uh, over and over again about Paul as he sings songs in prison. If anybody had any reason to grumble I would say Paul had a great argument for that. I mean, here he is writing, very uh, hungry, most likely, uh, most likely having been beaten, tied into chains or some kind of device. Not really sure exactly what this looked like, but the idea is he's there, he is not free to roam, and yet he finds great joy. You see, what he finds is what only the Spirit gives. We call this the fruit of the Spirit. Joy is one of those spiritual given things that we, we experience as we partner with God. 
also, it's a choice to be made. And there's an interesting uh, paradigm that, that I can choose joy, and yet the joy I'm talking about can only be given by the Spirit. Will I receive it is the question. Will I accept it? Let's look at, uh, at in what he said in the writing here, because this really just shocks me. Thinking that he's here in jail, he says this, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. There's this heart in him. He says, every time as I pray for you, as I'm reminded of you, in all ways and in every way I think of you, it wells up in me joy. There's a, there's a joy of partnership. There's a joy that when you know somebody cares about you, you find joy. And when you know that they're continuing the work that you're so passionate about, you find joy. I tried to define it. I looked at a lot of ways people define and I thought, well, here's how I might define joy like this. Joy is not determined by our current situation, but by our hope in Christ. Let's say that again. I want to I want to have you think about that. Joy is not determined by our current situation, but by our hope in Christ. First, I told you this is a spiritual gift. So as I place my faith in Christ, he says, now I want to give you peace. And I want to give you patience. And I want to give you joy. But secondly, is that there's this idea. Some people only focus on the future hope. And as a teaching team, we were talking about this and, and Jason says, hey, hey, take out future hope. Now, why? Not because it's wrong. It's that some people forget there's a present hope too, that I find hope daily in Christ. I find his presence daily, but I also uh, am so excited about the future hope. And as we'll get into later, Paul's going to talk about, man, I love the picture of the future hope. I really want heaven. I'm ready. But we're going to get into that later because I think what I want you to hear is that Paul is not stunted in his joy by his circumstances. So let me ask you, how is your joy? One, if, if you don't have Christ, you're going to have a tough time manufacturing joy. You might find happiness, which can be found in sometimes just as simple as buying something. You, you have a temporary state of happiness, but there's that deeper sense, that deeper joy. So how's your joy? Or have you allowed your situation to interrupt a joy that is waiting to be, to be birthed out of you? Just, I encourage you to take a little bit of time today through this message. Do some evaluation. Think about, where's my joy? Now, I understand. I, I get it. Having joy in Christ, experiencing joy does not mean, oh, I never have pain. Oh, I never have trouble. Oh, everything's perfect and rosy because of this joy. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying, though, is despite the marital circumstances, the physical challenges, the financial difficulties, Despite all of those, are you maintaining joy? Are you in line and in love with the Spirit of God and experiencing joy? So I want to tell you a story. Uh, recently, this is one of those moments where I wish I was watching myself, but it was me doing it, so I don't know what I looked like 100%. But have you ever used those virtual reality headset games? That is an incredible experience. I haven't done much of it. I used some ones earlier on where you put your phone in it. And it was all, always kind of hokey. Well, well, we put on this virtual reality, and I want you to set the picture. We're in the living room. So there's chairs and a couch, and we got family and friends around. And they said, hey, we've got a game, and we're playing these games. They said, oh, but you should try this one. It's called Walk the Plank. And here's a, a picture of it. Well, I have a serious fear of heights. Um, so for me, virtual meant like a fake reality. For me, it was actual reality. So I put on the headset and I, and I engage in this game where the elevator doors open. And then I'm really timid here. I'm scared. In fact, recently I was in Dubai and I went to the world's tallest building and I was standing on the ground looking up at it. And I started to get like, my knees started shaking. I'm just petrified about even looking up. It's so tall. So now I'm in this virtual reality game 
and I, I start to look out and I peek my head out and I'm looking around and I have completely forgotten where I am. I forgot I'm in the living room and in my mind, I am looking at a plank and that's all that's there and then a drop to the floor all the way down to the bottom floor, the streets, they're all waiting for me. And so trying to dis, I'm trying to separate my mind that says, this is real, to my other part of me that goes, yeah, but you're in your living room. So, so I'm walking on this thing and I'm just, I am so nervous. I can't, I can't balance. I'm like, I'm gonna fall, I'm gonna fall. And then my son, my 20 year old son comes over and pushes me off the plank and I about lose my mind. So I'm screaming, ah, and I close my eyes and I grab the VR set and I rip it off my head and I realize, oh, wait a minute, I'm in my living room. I was so caught in the moment. My behavior was definitely uh, an example of my belief. My belief was, oh man, I am on a plank hovering hundreds of stories above the ground. And my, my behavior was to scream. And I mean, if, if I would have lasted much longer, I don't know what I'd done, fetal position perhaps. And then I sat and I thought about it. Like, oh, come on, Craig, you can get over this. So I put the goggles back on and I'm, I'm gonna show you guys that I can do this. Because what we were doing was trying to encourage everybody to get on the plank and then just step off the plank and see what happens. So I, I'm like, I can do this. So I get over there and I get back on the plank and I'm waiting and I can't get my body to step off the plank. I can't do it. And of course, the whole time, remember, I'm in the middle of a living room and everybody's watching me with a big headset on. But for me, I'm in the city. So then I, I get down and I'm on my hands and knees. I, I, just look at the picture for a second. Put that up. Look at that picture. I'm on my hands and knees. I think I'm on this plank and I try to roll my body over and I can't do it. I'm not willing to fall. And then so I lay down. I lay down on the plank. I'm in the living room, but I think I'm on a plank and I am just freaking out. I can't do it. So, so I crawl back up and I get back in the elevator and I'm like, ah. I can't do it. So I took off the, the headset and I realized that my belief that I'm there is so strong that the way I'm responding is evident to everybody. Now, from their perspective, I'm in the living room wearing a big honking thing over my eyes. That's all they see. But I think I'm at the top of a building. My point is this. Do you believe that Christ's hope is so real? Have you experienced that hope in your life to the point that it affects your behavior? That it, it changes the way you see the world? I think Paul demonstrates that as he's in prison. He says, I know my circumstances are hard, but I've experienced God. I've experienced love. I've experienced peace and I'm experiencing joy. How are you doing with your experience of joy? The second thought that I wanted to bring into this, this picture of this community was this, this gospel partnership, is they had a shared identity. Think about it. We have Lydia, a wealthy, intelligent businesswoman. We have a slave girl who's got a spirit that's, that's possessing her. And we have a jailer, three very unique, separate lives, probably never would, would even interact with each other. But then the gospel comes in. Two of them respond in baptism. They bring their families in, they're baptized. They begin to pursue a life worshiping Jesus. They have a new identity. And that shared identity is the gospel. Look at how uh, Paul said it this way. Uh, verse five is where I wanted to focus on. He says, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, I find joy because of your partnership in the gospel from that first day, the moment you said yes, from the moment you were baptized, the moment you said, I surrender, that you became this new creation. The identity of who you were as a wealthy businesswoman or a jailer are gone. Those are still occupational things and they're great. Use them for God's glory. But your identity changed. 
gospel partnerships with a shared identity have a common purpose. I want you to take a minute. I'm gonna go fairly quick here, but I just want you to be reminded this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, Just put that list up for a minute. This is your identity. This is their identity. When you're in Christ, these are the, the phrases that are spoken over you. You are adopted. You can look all these up in scripture on your own. I didn't give you all the references, but you are adopted. You are now a child of God. You're forgiven, 100% forgiven for all past, present, and future sin. You're a new creation. The old is gone. You are loved. You are light. Let it shine bright. You're a citizen of heaven who's accepted, redeemed, justified. You're a saint. I struggle with that statement because saint is a, is a word that I just go, oh, some of my, my background as a Catholic student, as a kid, I just, I'm, I don't know if I'm a saint, but that's how, what you've been declared. You're salt. You've been developed to permeate the region, to bring flavor into your community of the gospel. And you are free. You are free. That slave girl, she understands freedom. She was freed from this spirit. The spirit that was taking over her life, she found freedom. Have you found freedom? This unity brings them together. This shared identity creates in them a shared purpose, a gospel partnership. Last one is a shared mission, and we keep hinting around this. But this idea is that it wasn't enough to get baptized and to see your family baptized. It was to say, this is great. Now we have a shared mission to take it with us. I love how Paul writes this in in verse seven. He says this, it's right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. In other words, you're my partner. I know you're with me, even in my imprisonment. And he finds joy that the the movement of God continues with these people, that they weren't hindered or halted by the situation, that that didn't stop them. They didn't go, well, Paul's in jail. That's it. We don't get to proclaim the gospel anymore. That there's a shared mission. That, that word confirmation, this idea that they're continuing, continuing in the establishment of the gospel. They're moving forward. And, and that brings great joy because they are spirit-led. They're not situation, situationally hindered. They're spirit-led. The, the spirit of God brings in them the shared mission, the shared identity, and the shared joy. And they follow where God is leading them. They continue to follow. And that's really brings me to this point. We've been talking at Family Church, trying to cast this vision that we're people helping people find and follow Jesus. People helping people find and follow Jesus. Do you see that life in our our reading today? Don't you see it? Here it is, this church where where Paul writes this, Oh, I find such great joy that you're people helping people, that you have a shared vision, a shared ministry. You have, you have a shared identity and it brings great joy. So here's my question. Who are your gospel partners? Do you have great acquaintances? Do you have loving friends? Those are all very good. Are any of them gospel partners? Are they the kind of people where when you gather, you say, yeah, that was good to be together. And so what is God doing in your life though? How are you interacting with your community? Where do you see God at work? I just want to encourage you in this season. We haven't abandoned the idea of community. In fact, we're taking the better together and we're launching it into Philippians to say, let's look at what the church looks like when they are better together. I love you guys. I'm going to release to the campuses. Talk to you soon. Well, thanks for hanging out with me today. It's uh, obviously one of these topics when we get going, I just, the time goes so fast. So before I I send you on your way, I want to perhaps have you leave with 
some things to think about. So first, let's go to what are the transformational moments? And here's the question. Are you partnering in the gospel? Are you at all involved in a movement of taking what you've received from Jesus and trying to help share it with somebody else? And it starts first with Jesus. So I wanted to put this here. Are you partnering in the gospel with Jesus first? That's, that's the heart behind this because that it's his gospel you're taking. I just want to encourage you to think about, are you partnering with him though? Are you going to him and seeking and asking and listening? Is your life of investment and worship at a place where if Jesus said, don't go there, you would know it was him. And if he said, that's where I want you to be, you would respond immediately. I love how Paul, uh, we see that as they're in the book of Acts there. And then the second port, port, part, of course, is um, are you partnering with others? I know what it's like. I, have, I, I get to travel the world. And I'll tell you, there are people that, that I often don't get to see for two to three years. And we talk, of course, on uh, Facebook or some other app or, or we do a Zoom call or maybe a phone call. But there is nothing like uh, remembering them in prayer and in communication. But then, of course, that moment when you get to see each other face-to-face during visits, whether they come here or there, there is so much joy that comes. It's, it's that picture of the Spirit of God and, and that person and the Spirit of God and me uniting in this common vision, this common directional thinking and passion. I encourage you to think about who are you partnering with? And if that's not something you're able to do or you haven't engaged in yet, I just want to challenge you to think about wherever you live, who is it that may be open to this idea of praying together and really seeking where God might lead you or a group of you to proclaim the gospel to those in your community? I'm going to send you off with one last thing. That's just this idea of the missional moment. I just want to encourage you to really consider what it's like to live this life of a blessed rhythm where you're always beginning in prayer, and then just watching, listening, eating when it's appropriate with others, inviting them into your home, going into their homes, serving others, being served by people, and sharing your life and sharing the gospel. I love you guys. Let me pray over you today, and then uh, we'll call it a day. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this story. What a powerful picture of gospel partnerships. God, I pray for each person listening, if they're not in a gospel partnership, God, that you would begin to stir in them a hunger for that and a desire to partner for the sake of the gospel, that those who are far from you would come into relationship with you because of those who are listening today. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you, guys.